I'm the comic weekly man, the jolly comic weekly man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you, happy boys and honey. Yes, boys and girls, it's comic weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm just as eager as can be because, you remember, you said you'd have a special surprise for me to tell my father and mother today. And I have. Well, quick, tell me, what is it? Well, you just tell them that beginning with next week, May 11th, the American Weekly is going to have a wonderful surprise for them. Oh, they love surprises, and so do I. What is the surprise going to be? Well, the entire magazine, the American Weekly, is going to be changed just for that benefit. Oh, you better think for them. How is it going to be changed? Well, the American Weekly is going to be printed by a new product with the latest technique and color, which means that the colors will be brighter and more brilliant and more true to life. Oh, like a technicolor? Yeah, that did. Oh, and then it'll be more beautiful, too. Oh, you bet it will be. Not only that, but it'll be printed on finer paper. And it'll be easier to read. Easier to read type. My father will like that because he says his eyes get the eyes get tired sometimes. I'll bet he'll like this, then, because he'll find it easy on the eyes because of his beauty and because it'll be easy to read. Well, I'll surely tell him what you said, and I know you'll be pleased. I'm sure he will be, too. And now I would be pleased if you would read me the funnies, please. Puck the Comic Weekly? Yeah. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. <laughs> Two crooks tried to steal the deed to Buck Peter's property. Offery had run the thieves down, captured the one who had the deed, and got the deed back for Buck. But one night, the thief was joined by his pal who rescued him and the two who escaped from the Bar 20 Ranch. Buck Peters had gone on by train to Wyoming. Hoppy, California, and Lucky, and the ranch hands are moving the furniture and other belongings by horse and wagon. As they near their destination, one of the ranch hands says to Hoppy, Hey, we must have scared those two saddle tramps off the Bar 20 good and proper. A week's traveling has put us within shouting distance of Buck's new ranch, but no sign of trouble. California, who's driving the wagon, hollers, Sure, shicks! I knew all along for it necessary to send Buck and Rose on ahead by train. You meant well, Hoppy, but there was nothing to fear. Suddenly, a volley of shots rings out from behind bushes and trees along the trail. Double back! Hoppy and his friends gallop for cover as the leader of the men who have fired at him shouts, That's the homesteader Sheldon told us about, men. Get your horses and ride them down. And this time, don't miss! Last picture, second row. Lucky looks back over his shoulder. He sees the ambushers on their horses coming after them and shouts, Whoever they are, they're coming for us! Hoppy yells, Head into that cave. It's the only place we can make a stand. First picture, bottom row. The ambushers rein in a short distance from the cave. Hey, they hold up where our guns can't touch them. Well, scatter to one side and block that hole with dry brush. They dismount, slip around to the side of the cave where they're out of range of Hoppy's guns, and quickly they pile dry brush into the cave's opening. Higher and higher builds the pile, and then one of the men throws a lighted stick into the brush. The brush catches on fire and fills the opening of the cave with a thick cloud of smoke. Last picture, inside the cave, California exclaims, Hi there, buzzards. They're trying to smoke us out. Hoppy says grimly, or suffocate us. We won't have much choice once this cave fills up. Why do you suppose those people attacked Hoppy and his friends? Well, I have a hunch that the two crooks have ridden on ahead and have stirred up the people who live in Wyoming and made them think that Hoppy and his friends are going to try to take their land away from them. But why would they do that? Well, you see, that way they figure that the people will drive Buck Peters and Hoppy away, and then the two crooks will get Buck Peters' ranch. 
Why, that's an awful thing to do. Yes, it is. Oh, I wonder whether Hoppy will find a way to tell those people that he is honest. He doesn't want to take away their land from them. Well, we'll find out about that next week. Now... Oh, now can we go over to page three? Because I'm sure we'll find Prince Valiant there. Very well, over the page we go. And you're right, here he is. And last week, you remember, the missionaries had arrived from home, and now the little baby twins can be christened. Yes, and I know you're anxious to find out about that. So here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Gray, Mulkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> year now since Val went to Rome to find missionaries who would come to Thule to bring the word of God to the wild northerners. And now, after a long, hard journey on land and sea, Rufus and Egil arrive with the churchmen. But only a few of the missionaries have survived the perilous journey from Rome. But those that are left are ready to begin at once their task of teaching Christianity to the Northmen. Last picture top row, and old fortress is converted into a church. But 300 years will pass before the stubborn Vikings will renounce the warlike gods of their fathers and accept Christianity. Both Rufus and Egil have become Christians and have taught the missionaries to speak the northern tongue. First picture, second row, Val announces, Well, as I'm the father, a prince and heir to the throne... I shall, of course, choose the name. But Alita forces Val gently into a seat. Second picture, second row, Val stumbles into a chair as she tells him that she will name her babies, and she says, furthermore, first picture, bottom row, one will have a name that has the melody of the south wind in it, and the other will be named for the robust north. Val, who has been trained to command, who never takes a backward step in the face of danger, gives in. For it's like honey to be bullied by Yelita. And he also knows that beneath those shining curls, there is hard common sense. And then last picture. The king issues a proclamation for everyone to attend the christening. For the christening of the twins is to be a grand occasion. Be. Well, I don't know what the one name for the south wind would be, but I can guess what the one whose name for the north wind would be. What do you think the one who will be named for the north wind will be? Oh! <laughs> You're silly. <laughs> no one would name a baby that. Oh, I was just teasing you. I don't know what they'll be named either. Next week, maybe we'll find out. Now? Oh, well, now I'd like to read Donald Duck. Very well. Turn over the page. Go past Perry Mason and the Lone Ranger. Cross over the page, past Jungle Jim. Turn over that page. On and here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squeeze them, chicka chack. Let's have music to better quack quack. <laughs> Donald is talking on the phone to his girlfriend, Daisy. He's saying to him, We're invited to Mrs. Van Swank's garden party this afternoon. Oh, now, big deal. Daisy goes on. I'm on the reception committee, so I'll meet you there. Now remember, it's a garden party, so wear something appropriate. Don't worry, Doc. That afternoon, Daisy comes to Mrs. Van Swank's garden party dressed in her best jacket and hat. Because, of course, a garden party is a very fashionable affair where both women and men dress in their nice summery clothes. And then, Daisy hears... Ah, Doc. She turns around and sees Donald wearing a battered straw hat, a pair of overalls, and carrying a rake and a hole. And everybody gasps. <laughs> Donald says, last picture... When do I start gardening? And Daisy falls in a faint. <laughs> No wonder Daisy painted. Oh, that down so funny. He makes me laugh. Me too. Now look across the page. Oh, Uncle Remus, please read that. Very well. Here we go with Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. 
Hippity hoppity, make it a habit to give us music for old bull rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says, when Br'er Rabbit helps the children, he helps them every which way. Br'er Rabbit is out in the forest, up on the tree, filling a pail with grapes, which the folks in the community call Cuppernaw. Little Racky Coon is on the ground beneath Br'er Rabbit, who's tossing grapes down to Little Racky Coon. At moment, Br'er Buzzard, who happens to be dawdling along, sees what's going on, and he exclaims, well. Bless my eyeballs. Them wild grapes looks good. Mm. He sneaks up. The little Racky Coon. And grabs the grapes out of his hand. <coughs> little critter, you is had enough. First takes the bottom row, little Racky Coon puts up his fists and dances around in front of Brer Buzzard, shouting. Give me that. You give me them stubborn on, or I'll splatter your nose all over your ears. Brer Buzzard leans back against the tree, saying... You is too little to hurt a flea. Racky Coon shouts, I'll show you. Just then, Burr Rabbit, who's up on the tree, whacks Burr Buzzard in the head with a pail. <laughs> and last picture, Burr Buzzard staggers down the road. That's the b- b- bamminous little one I is ever met. Burr Rabbit chuckles and says, <laughs> You just wait, little Racky Coon. I'll get you some more scupping ongs. And Uncle Remus says, uh, It ain't what you take, it's what you get for taking. Oh, God, that Brer Buzzard got just what he deserved, that big boy picking on little Racky Coon. Yes, wasn't that a good joke yeah. on him? He thinks that little Racky Coon gave him a punch that knocked him dizzy. <laughs> I'll bet you he'll never do anything to Racky Coon again. I'll bet he won't either. And now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, and here they are on the first page of the second section. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim Zem Zombie, conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Dagwood's boss is going away for an overnight trip, and he's decided to take Dagwood along with him. As they're ready to leave, Blondie tells Mr. Dithers how nice it is of him to take Dagwood along. Dithers replies, Oh, he's a fine boy. I love him as if he were my own son. They go out to the car. Last picture, top row, they find the car is a flat tire. Dithers exclaims, Oh, dear, a flat tire, and we haven't even started yet. My spare is soft, too. Dagwood says, Oh, don't worry, boss. I'll take your spare up to the filling station and get it repaired in a jiffy. First picture, next row, Dagwood's at the filling station talking to the station attendant who's fixing the tire. Well, that was a big job carrying that tire up the hill. The station attendant finishes his job and says, Well, it'll be easier going back. You can roll down the hill. Dagwood starts back down the hill, rolling the tire. Yeah, this is a lot easier. It's so hey, hey, wait. No, the, the, the dots are fast. The tire begins to roll faster and faster. Hey, wait, wait. It gets away from Dagwood, rolls down the street, knocks over two wheels. Oh, oh, I drive it, drive it. First picture, next row, knocks over a vegetable stand. Huh? Hey, what's the matter with you? It's the matter with you. Then it rolls into a china store. Last picture, first row. Dither sees Dagwood coming along carrying the tire, followed by a lot of people. Ah, uh, here he comes with a tire at last. I wonder why the crowd is following him. Dagwood starts to put the tire in the car, and the crowd gathers around Mr. Dither's. And one says, You owe me $20. Another says, And you owe me 15 Dither starts handing out money as fast as he can, paying off all the damage that Dagwood has done. Hey, you owe me $40. <laughs> Finally, the crowd is left. Dagwood says to Mr. Dithers, Okay, boss. The tire is on. We're all ready to go now. Dithers grits his teeth and knocks Dagwood down. Then he hops in his car and drives off. And there Dagwood is left, lying on the sidewalk with his aching head. 
Blondie comes running out and says she thought he was going with the Dagwood answers. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. Oh, poor Dagwood, he always gets into trouble. Oh, he certainly <laughs> did today. But didn't that tire look funny running down the street, knocking people over and knocking vegetables over? Yes, it did. <laughs> and say, that reminds me. It's a good idea for children to keep their eyes open when they're walking along the street because sometimes wheels will come off a car and roll wild that way. Yes, but sometimes something like that happened one time when my father and I were walking down the street and the hubcap came off of a car and rolled right straight towards us and my father pulled me aside just in time. Well, then, you know what I'm talking about when I say you never can be too careful when you're near a street where there's traffic. Yes, I know. Mm-hmm. Well, now look, underneath Dagwood, Roy Rogers. Oh, yes. You remember, Roy and his friend Chubby Walden found the girl in the desert who pretended that she'd fainted. Yes, he said she was a school teacher who was on her way to Chubby's desert mansion. And then when Roy went to get her wagon, which had been broken, he saw two men riding off with it. And this is all part of a plan to trick Chubby Walden. And I wonder what it is. Well, last week, Roy caught up with those two men when the wagon overturned. They were trying to run away from him. Let's see what he discovered today. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip I oh now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip I oh The two men picked themselves up from the ground after the wagon overturned. Roy holds his gun on them, saying, Are You two road agents sure made a mess of stealing the school teacher's wagon and traveling bags. Put your hands up. The men stand up. One of them holds up his hands, telling Roy that he's made a mistake. The one named Gaucho kneels over to get up. He's holding a strange-looking rope with knobs on the ends of it. Suddenly, his hand flashes out and whips around Roy's wrist, knocking the gun out of his hand. Roy stumbles over backwards to avoid getting hit in the face. Last picture top row, the man named Joan picks up Roy's gun and hands it back to him, saying, Hey, you must excuse my excitable friend here for using his bowler. I uh, once saved Gaucho's life in the Argentine. He has a good sense of loyalty. Here you are. Oh, thanks. So that was a South American bowler, huh? Well, some weapon. Roy gets up saying, first take the next throw. Well, I guess I picked you gents wrong. Shelby Walden will lend you mount. He's at a dry water hole where we found Miss Drake, the school teacher. They head back to the water hole. Joan and Gaucho riding the horse that was hitched to the wagon. Gaucho whispers to Joan. In the survey, what did the senorita give us away? Don replies, Well, Senor, no one just thinks the beans working for me. Once you get inside the rich desert rat rancho, the rest will be easy. They ride up to the water hole. The girl sees Roy has her bags and says, Oh, oh, thanks for fetching my bag. I'd have been lost without them. Roy holds the bag out to her last picture, saying, Oh, these gents are Derby Doan and Gaucho, man. Oh, I'm sorry. As everyone looks down, Chubby explains, Hey, what's a school teacher doing with a bag full of tools? I'll bet I know what the tools are doing in that bag. What? I'll bet he was going to try to get into Chubby's house, and then he was going to let those other two men in, and they were going to use these tools to open Chubby's safe and rob it. I have a hunch you might be right. I'll be eager to see how the girl explains about those tools. So will I. Well, we'll find out about that next week. Now let's turn over the page and see who's there. All right. Oh, look, it's Flash Gordon. And you remember, Flash has been captured by the giants on the planet here. And last week, the giants defeated the rescue rocket ship from Earth. And one of the ships exploded in the air when it was hit, and Dale was thrown out of it, and she was floating in space. I wonder what happened to her. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega, rega, doon, doon, fast, and fast. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Cast adrift in space, Dale clambers onto a tiny sphere that crosses her path while revolving in its orbit around Saturn. Investigating her hazardous search, he accidentally touches a spring laser that opens a hatch and reveals a complex mass of electronic observing and signaling devices. Meantime, back on Rhea, a scientist discovers the accident when his recorder receives scrambled signals. He reports... The observation satellite 17-3 is out of order. Some battle debris must have fouled up its teletender. 
Last picture top row, the space scanner is quickly focused on the trouble area, and Dale's image appears on the screen. The Rian King orders her rescued alive. I want to make tests on these earthlings to see how much Rian gas we need to kill them when we conquer their planet. <laughs> rescue rocket with flash aboard his interpreter is dispatched to the tiny satellite. The Rian ship cuts across the scout moon's orbit, just as Dale, her oxygen supply exhausted, lets go and drifts away into space unconscious. Dale is quickly taken on board the Rian ship, where the anxious flash uses his utmost skill to revive the air-starved girl. Dale, darling, don't die. Flash is relieved as she starts breathing weakly. Most of the Rian crew was outside repairing their scout moon. Flash sees his big chance. Suddenly, using a judo trick, he flips a surprise guard over his shoulder and snatches his spark gun. And as the second guard looks dumbfounded, Flash orders, fire the long-range rockets. We're blasting off on a trip to Earth. Well, let's hope he's lucky and can manage to get back to Earth safely before the other rocket ships go after them. Do you think he'll make it? That's something we'll find out next week. Now, let's go over to the very last page to Dick's Adventure. Oh, yes. I'm anxious to see what's happening because Dick is in the early days of America on the famous ship, Constitution. Yes, he's in the American Navy. And they were chasing a British ship. And they saw this British ship and it started to run away. And they're setting a trap for the Americans. And I wonder what that trap is. Well, let's read now and see if we can find out. Here we go with Dick's adventure. Say the magic words with me. Riggedy Pack is back to Dick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. What no one aboard the Constitution realizes this July night of 1812 is that the British frigate, racing ahead as if trying to escape a fight, is only bait trying to lead the Americans into a trap. Dick peers uneasily into the darkness, but cannot see the shadowy forms of six enemy men of war against the far horizon waiting. First picture, second row, Dick tries to fathom what's troubling him, for he seems to remember something. That British ship or not, we're pretty evenly matched, side for size, gun for gun. But why did she run the second she saw us? In the pale hour before dawn, the pursued quarry is suddenly swallowed up in a bank of mist. The last picture, second row, when it lifts, Dick shouts, Enemy sails, three in the starboard, four off the stern. First picture, bottom row, Captain Isaac holds the verge of trap. Two ships, uh, yeah... Three. Perhaps we could... Haven't you? No, we won't fight. Clear away. But there's no clearing away, no moving. The wind has died down to a dead calm. Your last picture, like painted ships on a painted ocean. The Constitution and its enemies face each other. Luckily, just out of gun range. Captain Hull says, We'll move out of here if we have to haul this ship ourselves. Yes. That's not such a bad idea. A few minutes later, on orders, ropes are made fast to the prow of the becalmed ship, and small boats are lowered over the side. You mean they're going to have men in little rowboats who are going to try to pull that great big ship away out of danger? That's exactly what they're trying to do. But how can they get very far that way? Well, you way? see, the captain hopes they'll get far enough away... So that when the wind comes up, he'll have a head start on the British ship. Oh, we... and then, then you'll be able to escape. That's what he hopes. And we'll find out if he does next week. Now look, underneath Dick's adventures, Rusty Riley. Oh, and at last the sheriff and the detective and Mr. Miles and Rusty and Pat and Tex have come to the old abandoned house where those crooks are looking around to find those trophies that they stole and hid there. Yes, now I know you're anxious to see if they're captured. So let's read. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and rusty. <laughs> Sir Percival and Nobbs have found the trophies in the cistern where Rusty had hidden them. Third picture top row, they start up the stairs. Sir Percival says, Here we go, Nobby. Within an hour, we'll be aboard a luxury streamliner. 
living a life of ease in some distant city. At last, picture in the shrubbery outside, Rusty and the others see the inspector's flashlight give the signal that Sir Percival and Hobbs are coming out. Then, first picture bottom row, the door opening. Sir Percival and Hobbs step out. Suddenly, the lights are flashed on them. I say, what's the matter? And the detective shouts, All right, Duke and Limey Joe, put him up. This is the end of the line for you. A little later in the inspector's office, the detective is saying, Well, Jack, you were right. Those two birds have been on the wanted list for some time. I think these boys are in line for a reward. Tech smiles. Well, I was always sure the boys didn't steal those trophies. And then the detective turns to Rusty and says, uh, Boys, I wish you'd clear up one point. With a statewide alert out for your car, why wasn't it picked up? Where on earth is it? Pete answers. Oh, that's... Well, well, sir, when they locked us in the colossal cavern, they put the car in there, too, you see, and we used its battery for a light. Last picture, one of the officers comes up to Mr. Miles and says, oh, Excuse me, Mr. Miles. Uh, your daughter just phoned. There's a gent waiting to see her. She says his name is Colorado Colby. Oh, good gracious. I've been so taken up with this affair, I forgot he was coming. Oh, come on, boys and Tex. This may mean a trip for you three. and we're put in jail, which is just what they deserve. And next week, we'll find out who this Colorado Colby is. Oh, I bet that means you're going to start a new adventure. I bet you you're right. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I got to go now. All right. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funny to you happy boys and honey. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.